So in today's class, we continue on discussing halogenation reactions via the radical mechanism. Um, in particular, during today's class, we're going to start off discussing allylic halogenation. Right? And we're going to look at it from the bond dissociation energy perspective. Right? So if you recall, when we're talking about carbon-hydrogen bonds, Right, with the lowest bond dissociation energy is going to undergo radical abstraction faster than the others. So when we compare the different types of carbon-hydrogen bonds in the molecule drum below, right on the top of the molecule, we have a vinylic CH bond. Right, the vinylic CH bond has a bond dissociation energy of 444 kilojoules per mole. Just below, in blue, we have an, right, an allylic CH bond, right? So let me write out the words, allylic and right, vinylic. So our allylic CH bond has a bond dissociation energy of 364 kilojoules per mole. You can see much weaker um, then the vinylic one. And last, we have our alkyl CH bond with a bond dissociation of 402 kilojoules per mole. So you can see very quickly that allylic CH bonds are going to undergo hydrogen abstraction much more quickly than any of the other hydrogens that are found in this molecule. If you take a closer look at the hydrogen abstraction of the allylic hydrogen, right? When we do this hydrogen abstraction here, we end up with an allylic radical, and that allylic radical is able to undergo resonance back and forth between placing the radical at either end, right? The right, left side, right side, and that resonance stabilization is what leads to that much lower bond dissociation energy we observed on the previous slide. Uh, and we talked in, in the past about the bromination reaction via the radical mechanism. So this is why bromination of the alkene is going to be very selective for the allylic carbon. Right? So if we react BR2, shine some light on it, create bromine radicals, our bromine radical abstraction on cyclohexene is going to exclusively produce the allylic bromide product. Right? The problem with this reaction, and if you recall, when we take an alkene and we react it with Br2, right, we this reaction can also undergo the bromonium reaction, right? Where we can generate the Br bromonium ion followed by bromine addition, right, giving us an overall dibromo addition product, right, so we can, so this is a competing reaction where we have Br2 reacting with the alkene. So this is obviously going to be a problem. If our goal is allylic bromination, we're going to have a problem where Br2 is going to be reacting right alongside with that carbon-carbon double bond. So to overcome this problem of bromine reacting with the carbon-carbon double bond in addition to allylic bromination, we've scientists have invented a reagent called NBS. NBS stands for n bromo suck cinnamon. So n-bromosuccinamide, NBS, is the structure down, down here below, right? So n-bromosuccinamide is, as you can see, has a nitrogen-bromine bond. And by reacting n-bromosuccinamide with, you know, activating it, I should say, with light, we create bromine radicals just as if we were to take bromine, Br2, and shine light on it, right? We shine light on that, and we create, uh, let me erase that, create two bromine radicals, 
right? So we're generating bromine radicals, and as a byproduct, we have this resonance stabilized succinamide radical. The key here is that NBS, unlike BR2, is able to keep the concentration of HBr and Br2 very, very low. So we don't have any competition for these addition reactions where the Br2 reacts with the alkene. So we are able to lower that byproduct in the reaction. So once we've generated the bromine radical, hydrogen abstraction will, via a one electron mechanism, uh, abstract the hydrogen in the first step. Right, so we have a single electron from the bromine reacting with one of the electrons in the carbon-hydrogen bond to form HBr. And the last electron being left in the allylic position. So again, the first propagation step is hydrogen abstraction. The HBr that's produced will react with NBS. Right, it reacts with NBS to form Br2. Okay, so what we're talking about here, right, is if I'm going to draw it in up above, we take NBS, it reacts with HBr and yields succinamide. plus Br2. So we're able to generate small quantities of Br2 in this reaction by this HBr that's generated in the very first step. So as we create a radical, as soon as we create a radical, we then create a molecule of Br2, and that Br2 can be then used in the second halogen abstraction step. Right, so in the second halogen abstraction step, right, we have the electron from the allylic radical reacting with one of the two electrons of the bromine-bromine bond, again, in the single uh, electron reaction, and the last electron being transferred to the bromine atom. Right, so we form this new carbon-bromine bond at the allylic position. We regenerate our bromine radical, that bromine radical that can then cycle back into the reaction in the first step, recreating our radical, and the process starts over and over again. So you can see the amount of bromine that's generated, and it's immediately consumed in the following step. So NBS gives us a very controlled mechanism to produce bromine via the HBr that's produced in the first propagation step. Right, so this is a, an excellent way to limit the amount of Br2 that's present in solution that can then undergo the addition reaction with the alkene. So if we have an asymmetric alkene, we're going to generate a mixture of isomeric products in the reaction. So you can see Right, and this reaction here, this alkene is not symmetric, right? There's a isopropyl group over here on the right-hand side and, and a hydrogen, whereas the left-hand side just has two hydrogens. So when we react this with NBS, we create two different products, right? And the reason for that, right, we create a product where the bromine here is has reacted at the tertiary center, but we also create a product where the bromine is stationed at the primary center. Right, so if we go back to the uh, starting material, we're talking about this tertiary center here and the primary coming off of the carbon-carbon uh, double bond. And that second product that's produced in the reaction is due to the delocalization that occurs between the two carbon atoms when you generate an allylic radical. Right, that allylic radical that you generated in the first step with NBS, we show here, that first radical undergoes resonance, right? We can just draw the mechanism there, right? 
undergoes resonance to generate our uh, other allylic radical, which can then react with bromine to generate the primary bromide. So when you have a lack of symmetry by having these substitutions, right? You have a substitution here and here. So you have your radical down below is not symmetrical. And when you have this lack of symmetry um, between the two different resonance structures, you're always going to generate two possible products. So now we're going to change gears a little bit um, and talk a little bit about some atmospheric chemistry, and in particular radical chemistry with ozone. Um, I find this kind of an interesting topic, um, not quite as relevant to performing organic chemistry, obviously, in the laboratory, but important to understand what's going on in society, especially when um, you have people in the news or you might encounter people who stout start um, discussing the topic who have no knowledge of what they're discussing and, and simply speak um, whatever jargon they've been told via probably some newscaster who didn't know what they were talking about either. Um, so having an understanding of this I think is useful. So when we're talking about ozone, right, um, the ozone is both created and destroyed in the upper atmosphere. You've probably heard this before. Um, back when I was a kid, there was actually a hole forming in the ozone layer. Um, we'll discuss why that is in a few more slides. But that was a very important thing because when we think about ozone, we have, you know, there's basically no net reaction overall, but UV radi radiation is converted to heat. And this is key, right? So if you have UV shining down on us from the sun, if we didn't have an ozone layer, right, if there was no ozone, that we have here that reacts with the UV, we would basically have direct UV, you know, 100% UV uh, absorption into our skin. You know, some of it obviously escapes through, which is why, you know, we always discuss having, adding sunblock when you go to the beach. But if you didn't have the ozone layer, all of the sun's rays that were in the UV spectrum would reach us, not just very a few that do. Well, that byproduct, that reaction between ozone and the UV light, it generates oxygen and the oxygen radical. Obviously, this is a very, um, uh, you know, very reactive radical. So, which is why you know you wouldn't want to spend much of any time floating around up in the upper atmosphere without some type of suit to protect you from the radicals. Uh, but the key here is as soon as these are generated, they react with each other, regenerating our ozone. And in the process, they release heat. So the net overall reaction is we take the UV sun from the UV from the sun and convert it to heat. So that Heats our upper atmosphere, heats our atmosphere, heat is radiating down upon us, and therefore we're protected from the harmful UV rays of the sun. So the reason this reaction works so well is because it's spontaneous, right? So we have a very high energy UV rays, which break down the ozone in the first step. But when we're talking about the heat that's produced, right? The heat that's produced in the second step that heat is a more disordered form of energy when we compare it to the UV rays of light. And if you think about it from an entropy, entropy perspective, right, it, the reaction becomes spontaneous, right? We're talking again about delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, right? So this disorder of heat increases and creates this second reaction, makes the second reaction spontaneous to regenerate our ozone layer. So back when I was younger um, was the time when we were very concerned about the ozone um, layer being depleted. And they discovered, or they believe they discovered that the cause were the chlorofluorocarbons that were depleting the ozone. Right, and this obviously ozone depletion 
is a very serious health and environmental problem, right? Because if we don't have ozone, the UV gets through and penetrates our atmosphere and cause, can cause lots of damage, not only to us, but to plants and um, buildings, everything. Any, any type of substance on the ground can be then degraded by UV rays because they're able to, again, generate radicals when they um, come, encounter a chemical. Again, there wasn't exact scientific proof, um, just lab-based proof. It's kind of hard to, um, you know, travel up into the upper atmosphere and identify the ultimate cause of what was depleting our ozone. But the belief was it was the chlorofluorocarbons, right? So chlorofluorocarbons, just referring to the compounds that have both chlorine atoms and fluorine atoms present, right? So you had freon-11, right, which is, you know, no, Again, known as chlorofluorocarbons, CFC11. We had CFC12 or freon12, right? Had two chlorine atoms and two fluorine atoms. And then we had CFC113, right? Freon113 had three chlorine atoms and three fluorine atoms. Um, again, these the problem with this was these chlorofluorocarbons once they reached the upper atmosphere, they reacted with the UV instead, and they formed chlorine radicals. And this is where the problem lies. So this slide gets a little bit more detail about the problem with chlorine radicals, right? These chlorine radicals are going to destroy the ozone. So the initiation step is we have the chlorofluorocarbon. We have the carbon-chlorine bond broken. We generate a carbon radical and a chlorine radical. It's the chlorine radical that's believed to be the problem. Because chlorine, the chlorine radical, reacts with ozone to form oxygen and this chlorooxy radical. That chlorooxy radical then reacts with another molecule of the oxygen radical that's typically created via ozone's reaction with UV. And that creates another molecule of oxygen, regenerates the chlorine atom, which can then re-enter the process back in the beginning. So you can see here, unlike the reaction of ozone with UV light to form oxygen and the oxygen radical, this process generates two molecules of stable oxygen. So we're breaking down the ozone and converting ozone into two stable molecules and that stops the, or removes ozone from our upper atmosphere, which therefore removes our protective barrier from the harmful UV rays of the sun. So uh, the industry, in particular the air conditioning industry, um, came up with alternatives to chlorofluorocarbons, and those were the hydrofluoroalkanes, so the HFAs. They're sometimes called hydrofluorocarbons as well. And all that refers to the fact that we have now hydrogen atoms and fluorine atoms in our molecules, right? HFA-134A, and then we have, you see the molecule here on the right, where it's just essentially mostly fluorine atoms, one hydrogen atom, it's HFA-227. And you can see, these aren't as harmful as the CFCs because they don't produce chlorine radicals, right? In this case, that fluorine carbon bond is much stronger, so the UV isn't going to break it down even if they do get up and in, into the upper atmosphere. But like any other um, gas that reaches our upper atmosphere, you know, um, you hear people complain about methane all the time. Well, these gases can also act as a greenhouse gas and trap in the heat at least according to the, the current science. So one of the biggest problems with organic compounds uh, that is in particular aren't sealed up very well in a bottle, for example, is auto oxidation, right? Auto oxidation, this is the process where those organic compounds, they react with atmospheric oxygen, right? It's just the oxygen in the air that we breathe and they form that oxygen that is in the air that we breathe, breathe once it reacts with the um, organic compound, creates a hydroperoxide, right? So we can see in this example, we take cumene, and cumene 
reacts with oxygen, it creates this humine hydroperoxide, right? The hydroperoxide structure refers to, right, we have the hydro OH, that's what that hydro stands for, right? The OH and then the peroxide referring to the fact that we have this oxygen-oxygen bond, right? So the cumene hydroperoxide is a degradation product of cumene. So if you were to leave cumene sitting on the bench for days, weeks, months, years, you would get a slow accumulation of cumene hydroperoxide just to, due to auto-oxidation in the air. It's a very slow process usually, um, but nonetheless uh, a process that you don't want to occur for you know any type of long-term storage of organic molecules. So let's take a look at the auto-oxidation mechanism. So you can see here the auto-oxidation mechanism begins with some type of initiator. Some initiator uh, reacts with a carbon-hydrogen bond, abstracts the hydrogen, and creates a alkyl radical. You know, if you recall, right, this initiation step, as we described it in previous uh, examples, we call actually propagation. So we have to kind of, you know, re re revise our definitions um, because now it's not it's essentially not considered a propagation step because this radical that's generated then goes on to react with a molecule of oxygen. Right, this is known as a coupling step, right? This coupling step where the carbon radical couples with molecular oxygen to form a peroxy radical. That peroxy radical then undergoes a hydrogen abstraction, right? And it undergoes a hydrogen abstraction, right, where we form a new oxygen hydrogen bond and then generate regenerate the carbon radical in the this step, right? So we form our hydroperoxide and regenerate the carbon radical, which can then propagate the reaction over and over again. In this particular example, right, the termination step would consist of the carbon radical coupling with another carbon radical and destroy the radicals forming a new carbon-carbon bond. So if we take a look at that auto-oxidation mechanism in more detail and calculate what the net overall reaction is, right? So we need to understand, right? What, what is propagation, right? These propagation steps can be precisely defined as the steps that add together to give the net chemical equation. Okay, so the first step shown on the previous slide was the coupling step. Second step is the hydrogen abstraction step. Right, the coupling step starts with a carbon radical and the hydrogen abstraction step ends with a carbon radical. So these radicals, is they're on opposite sides of the equation, cancel each other out when we sum the equations together. Again, the peroxy radical that was generated in the step above is the, begins the reaction of the hydrogen abstraction. So again, these cancel each other out as well. So the overall net reaction is we have a carbon-hydrogen bond, right? so an alkane, which reacts with an oxygen molecule to give us a hydroperoxide. Right? So the net reaction overall is drawn here down below, where the, again, the alkane reacts with the oxygen to generate our peroxy, hydroperoxide. So when we discuss, you know, and, and in particular, right, so these initi the initiation and the termination steps, right, those are not actually part of the net chemical, chemical equation. So we don't include, uh, again, initiation and termination in our overall chemical equation because the overall reaction just consists of the two molecules coming together to form one product. So one class of molecules that are particularly susceptible to auto oxidation are ethers. Right? Ethers have a carbon hydrogen bond. Right? This carbon hydrogen bond 
that is adjacent to the oxygen, right? So this oxygen is able to help stabilize the radical intermediate that is generated. If you were to go through and show the, you know, the go through the entire process, right, you would generate a peroxy, I mean, a carbon-based radical, and that carbon-based radical, right, if we recall, radicals are defi electron deficient species, and we have electrons here, which, oops, I think it needs to be a single-headed arrow, we have electrons here, which can help to stabilize the adjacent radical, the lone pair on the oxygen, can help stabilize that, that radical that's generated. So ethers are particularly susceptible to auto-oxidation because of this, and they generate, again, a hydroperoxide. And this hydroperoxide that they've generated, because it's adjacent to an oxygen atom, is particularly unstable. And they actually can be very explosive. Uh, so when it comes to ethers, ether is actually not supposed to be stored for any long period of time without actually testing to prove you don't have any peroxides being formed. Um, you know, and the key, what they do typically with ethers is they store them in uh, dark containers. This prevents any light from initiating the auto oxidation reaction. Um, we'll try to keep oxygen out as best as possible, right? So if you can slow down the process overall, you can, you know, hold on to your, your chemicals a little, little longer. Um, hydroperoxides are actually, uh, of, of ethers, have been known to uh, cause pretty severe prop damage to buildings. There was, I um, don't remember the exact year, many years ago, uh, there were ethers that were being stored in a very old organic synthesis lab and there were four liter bottles, several of them, shoved underneath the hood, way in the back, been there for years, if not decades. Slow uh, hydroperoxide formation generated this so solid hydroperoxide that sat at the bottom. And these are shock sensitive, which means that um, just like nitroglycerin, you hit, you bump it, you, you know, shock it a little bit in any way, and they auto ignite. And once they auto ignite, the entire container um, took off. So you have this great flammable organic solvent along alongside an organic material. And the entire sides of the building were blown out of the lab, killing obviously the scientist that was digging through the cabinet to try to uh, uh, remove the material, probably just to use it for his experiment for the day. So Again, ethers, one of those things, you know, you don't want to keep them around for decades without actually mm -hmm. testing to make sure that they're actually still stable. Or not stable, but uh, free of hydroperoxides. So when it comes to um, the world of biology, biochemistry, we frequently talk about antioxidants. And in particular, the reason that we talk about antioxidants is because we're referring to them in the presence of, or the stability of, triglycerides, right? Because we know, you know, triglycerides, right? These are a picture of a triglyceride shown below, right? Because we have glycerin, you know, the molecule shown there, and we have the fatty acids attached to the glycerin molecule, hence the term triglyceride. They're very important for a healthy diet, um, but the problem with them is they're also very susceptible to auto-oxidation. And in particular, it's because we have all the carbons that are very reactive. As you can see, this molecule has a whole set of allylic carbons that are present on both sides of the carbon-carbon double bonds. And over time, fats that are stored that have carbon-carbon uh, double bonds uh, undergo auto-oxidation. And this hydroperoxide that's formed is a very rancid tasting, rancid smelling molecule and actually extremely toxic. You know, thankfully our noses are able to smell how gross it is, so we don't eat it because it would be poisonous to us. Um, but this process actually is potentially one of the, the triggers of disease states in, in people where um, when we, when you think of uh, 
vegetable oils, right? The vegetable oils are these nice crystalline, I mean, crystal clear yellow oils. And I don't know, you know, about you, but the last time I looked at my corn, I didn't really see any yellow oil that was, you know, coming and oozing out of the corn or, you know, last time, you know, so you often have to ask the question, where, where does this, you know, where does corn oil come from? Most people haven't seen canola, so I can't really ask you about canola oil. Um, but, you know, when you're thinking about things, uh, you know, oils, vegetable oils that you're using on your food, you know, when I think of corn, I don't think of oil, but yet corn oil is a, an oil that is used, you know, in significant quantities. Um, soybeans, another one, you don't typically think soybean and oil. So when they purify and extract out all the oils from the beans and the corn, they then need to purify them and they purify them in these, you know, I've mentioned this before in class in these large stills and those large stills, you know, they boil and separate out the fractions frequently will, you know, create problems, right? Because you generate trans double bonds. Those trans double bonds can be then easily uh, auto oxidized or even oxidized in the body um, via some auto oxidation processes. And, you know, just sitting in the bottle, the oils slowly go bad over time. And this is particularly a problem with vegetable oils because vegetable oils are full of carbon-carbon double bonds. They're, you know, you can look up the, you know, just search Wikipedia, look for canola oil or vegetable oils, um, content of their fatty acids. And you'll see that most of the fats that are found in vegetable oils have double bonds. Whereas animal fats are primarily saturated, so they don't have any of these fats, so they're not going to undergo auto oxidation, which is why I don't know if you, you know, your grandmother keeps a, a jar of bacon grease on the counter for long periods of time, or if even you keep your butter on the counter for uh, any any length of time because you want soft butter and it doesn't go bad, doesn't spoil, doesn't taste bad. The reason for that is because it's primarily saturated fats and those saturated fats aren't able to undergo auto oxidation. So if you're eating any type of prepackaged food, anything that's not fresh, it needs to be packaged. And if it has unsaturated fatty acids present in it, it's going to have a short shelf life, right? And this is why the food industry uses preservatives. They need to preserve and keep the fats from spoiling over time to give the nasty rancid flavor and thus stop you from eating them. And here are a few examples of these radical inhibitors that are used in food, right? There's BHT, which is stands for butylated hydroxytoluene, right? When they're talking about uh, hydroxytoluene is the structure here, right? Hydroxy referring to the OH, toluene referring to a methyl group on the benzene ring, and is butylated, right? This is tert butyl, but you know, hence four carbons, it's got two but you know, butylated groups on it. There are also butylated hydroxy anisole, BHAs, right? And the difference here is that like, we have hydroxy anisole here, again, the hydroxy group. And instead of a methyl group off of a benzene ring, the O-methoxy group um, off of a benzene ring is known as anisole. Right, so you have this butylated group, again, butyl groups present, um, hydroxy anisole. Right, these two molecules are used as preservatives to uh, prevent radicals from being formed in food. So these preservatives, right, they act as radical scavengers, right, where BHT can prevent thousands, right, thousands of auto oxidation reactions from occurring. Um, and the reason that for that is, right, BHT first undergoes a hydrogen abstraction to scavenge the radicals that would otherwise initiate auto oxidation, right? So you have BHT, it reacts with the radical under a hydrogen abstraction up here, Right, that radical abstracts the hydrogen off the of BHT. We generate the BHT radical and we terminate right, the radical that was formed in the previous step. So we stop the propagation 
from occurring to lead that leads to auto oxidation. Um, a lot of times, you know, any type of inhibitor like BHT is also often called antioxidants, right? When we're talking about you know antioxidants all the time in our food, BHT is just a synthetic antioxidant that is you know added to foods to stop this step from occurring. Many times you'll see that your food has some type of natural antioxidant added. Um, and that's, and again, they're trying to prevent oxidation of the cell membranes and other biologically important compounds um, when you're eating them, but your food can actually have these, these uh, natural antioxidants added. Um, but typically, you know, you want to have a diet that's rich in vitamin E because vitamin E, again, you can see that hydroxyanosol kind of built in here, right? Hydroxyanosol that's built into vitamin E that helps to prevent radicals, stops radical formation um, in the body. So vitamin E is very important antioxidant. Um, you know, it's key here is vitamin E is hydrophobic, right? So it's able to find its way into cell membranes. So vitamin E is important antioxidant in the cells, in the cell membranes, stopping the fats that are part of your cell membranes from being auto-oxidized. You know, obviously you don't really think about it, but you know, there's oxygen that's being carried by via hemoglobin throughout your body and being released into your cells. And that oxygen is able to be oxidized, auto-oxidized in the environment of the cell and vitamin E helps, helps to prevent that. Another one, vitamin C, right? Vitamin C, we've all heard about it. It doesn't look anything like, you know, the other antioxidants we were talking about, but we have several hydroxy groups. And in particular, it's, I believe it's this hydroxy group down here that is in resonance where the, well, the radical that would be generated here would be in resonance with the double bonds between the carbon-carbon double bond and the carbon-oxygen double bond. Um, obviously, with all of these OH groups, the difference for between vitamin C and vitamin E is vitamin C is very polar, and it is going to, therefore going to function in polar mediums, such as the blood, right? So vitamin C is our antioxidant flowing around in the water, and vitamin E is our antioxidant floating around in our hydrophobic membranes.